in rural Shropshire, close to the border with Wales, is hidden the most fascinating of historic homes. Today, I am at Pitchford Hall, and Pitchford is considered England's finest Elizabethan half-timbered house. It was actually lost by the family in 1992. However, they managed to get the house back 25 years later. This is an extraordinary story of heartbreak and stoic determination. Thank you very much. Cheers. With her husband James, Rowena Colthurst, whose mother inherited Pitchford in the early 1970s, has worked tirelessly to get the family home back. But now, they're faced with the enormous task of recovering the building from years of neglect. This is incredible. When I think of England, I think of green and houses that look just like this. Of course, it pulls at my heart because Hinchingbrook, we had to do the exact same thing. The house was sold in the 1950s and lost. This family, Rowena and James, managed to get their family home back, and I can't wait to find out how they did it. When I married into the British aristocracy, it was the start of a wonderfully exciting journey, but it was also a little daunting. I became a Viscountess, and for an American girl from a small town outside Chicago, that was quite a shock. I live with my husband, Luke, heir to the Earl of Sandwich, and our family at Mapperton House in Dorset. Living in a place like this is a joy, but also a challenge. And every day we're aware that we're preserving a very special part of Britain's heritage. Mapperton has opened up an extraordinary new world for me, and I can't wait to share it with you all. So if you love castles and manors and stately homes as much as I do, please join this American Viscountess as I journey into the British countryside in search of some of Britain's finest historic houses. Julie. This is Edward. Hi, Hi. Edward. Hi. Hi. So, and who's that? Doggy. Doggy? Love it. <laughs> um, well, it's amazing to be here. Are you going to show me around as well? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> oh my goodness. At the heart of the house is the Great Hall, where Rowena vividly remembers her mother's presence and tells me how the house was lost to the family in 1992. We used to have a settle here where my mum used to love sitting. She'd be draped in cats, sitting there as close as possible to the fire. <laughs> and that was basically a roaring of laughter, smoking lots of fags. I mean, absolutely outrageous. She was such a character. Oh, my goodness. I so can you, picture her there right now. You can, that's amazing. So you obviously grew up here. And then in 1992, my parents um, just literally, it felt like overnight suddenly told me they had to sell Pitchford. And my mum was the first person in the entire history of Pitchford since, you know, the medieval times to ever have to sell. And so it was absolutely disaster. But they were Lloyds of London victims, yes. both of them, same names in the disastrous syndicates. I mean, when I mean, it happened so fast, I couldn't believe it. Oh my goodness. So when they called you and told you, well, I mean, what did, do you remember that, that yeah, feeling? I, I remember it so well. I mean, James would tell you as well, and I was sitting on the Rundo so in floods of tears. And the um, incredible thing was, my husband is just as passionate about Pitchford as I am. Obviously, I was lucky enough to grow up in this idyllic house, but he um, immediately is a very positive person. He took me to this old oak tree, and we made a vow there and then that we'd try and do everything in our power to get the house back again. Oh my God. It took us 25 years of trying and trying and trying to get the house back. And here we are. And so. Here we are. Oh my gosh. Like, I mean, Rowena. You so, I mean, to see Edward oh, and Serena and Georgiana growing up and having the wonderful opportunities so, that I used to have. Yes. That's what really moves me. And people have been unbelievably 
positive and it's such a story of hope and it's it's been the most incredible experience oh my goodness so you spent with james 25 years doing everything you could yes. to get this house back in 1992 after valiant efforts to try to save pitchford hall for the nation including debates in the houses of parliament nothing could be done and in september that year the hall was sold. So there was the, um, all the contents had to be sold. So Christie's were kind of all over the place, like putting stickers on all our things. James and I were here taking stickers off. Meanwhile, my parents have completely distraught and have gone off to Mexico. I mean, it was just appalling. Oh my goodness, Rowena. The house got sold and I, in 1992, it was probably the worst possible time to sell a house given the sort of state of the economy and everything. They sold it uh, for under a million, like 700,000. I mean, yeah. nothing. They also had to pay back every penny we'd ever got for the roof, the 200,000 my dad had, you know, English Heritage gave us an amazing 80% grant for the roof, we had to pay that back. And then all the uh, contents got sold through Christie's. Through Christie's, and who bought it? So in the end, I, there were a few people who were interested, but the best option my mother thought was this Kuwaiti princess, because at least she had lots of money and she's talked a good game in terms of wanting to do lots of things to it. And, uh, and she was, of course, interested in the sale yard, but she really wanted to have loves horses, not houses, is my suspect, right. suspicion. Yeah. Right. So she was here really for the yeah. stables. She really wanted the stable yard because she had an Arabian stud farm, and that was the thing that was really important to her. So she didn't want the land. So we kept right. the estate. She had a ridiculous situation where we had all the estate, thousand acres or whatever, but minus the house. From the moment the house was sold in September 1992, Rowena and James vowed to somehow, one day, get the house back. History Hit is an award-winning streaming platform built by history fans for history fans. Enjoy our rich library of documentaries covering key events and locations of the medieval period. History Hit's medieval offering features leading historians such as Dan Jones, Eleanor Yanega, and Kat Jarman. Not only that, but we have a rich library of audio documentaries covering every period of history through our network of podcasts. Sign up now for a free trial and Chronicle fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code CHRONICLE at checkout. I, I really hope my mum would be happy to see us here today. Oh my gosh, she must be, you know, <laughs> jumping up and down for joy in, um, in greener pastures. I mean, that is... What a story that you got. I mean, I mean, but just the determination that you and James had to get this back. Pitchford traces its roots as far back as the Roman period. And you can really sense the layers of history here. Out on the estate, there's a special place where Pitchford derives its name. So basically this is the kind of most incredible thing. There's a natural phenomenon of pitch, like black sticky bitumen, you won't yeah. believe this, seeping up through the ground. And that is why it's called Pitchford. Because when I show you this incredible pitch well, next to, it's next to the forge. And I was always told that it's a sacred place. And that's why there's this incredible aura of goodness around Pitchford. Oh Go, my here. goodness. So here we go. Here's the, this is the pitch well, but it's so cool. <gasps> so I, I still get excited by this every time, and I've done this thousands this of times. This is the pitch. Wow. Basically, <gasps> this. Yes, yes. You're going to see. Look, can okay. you see? Can you see? There's so much of it. There is. Don't you think this is crazy? And yes. it's just. And if you smell it, it you... smells oil. Oil. Yeah. That's it's exactly right. Natural oil. And they think what? that. So there is a lot of Roman stuff around here because we have a Roman road going through the estate and we're part, you know, tributary of Watling Street. Right. And they think the Romans would have got so excited when they found this pitch that they might well have built a temple under the church. So we don't know for sure. So that's another thing to be discovered. Layers right. of history. Yes, and yes. And so there we are. <gasps> this, so this is, okay, this is the pitch well, but is the pitch everywhere or is it just, just here just here just, just here, here. <gasps> just literally here this, this is it i'm always fascinated by how these houses um have their names the origins of them and so the pitch there and then we're coming up to the ford the here ford. and then there's the pitchford family who were here in the medieval times and the pitchford church was built by one of the pitchfords and the pitchford medieval house is under the tudor house is and it? there's a crown oh. post in the attic that i'll show you that proves that it's the medieval house <gasps> that the pitchford family used to live in so right we feel very much that they're an incredibly important part of the 
Of course. Mm -hmm. Well, is of the story. So underneath the house that I see now, this Elizabethan half timbered house underneath is the medieval. The medieval, the guts of the, you know, a proper kind of open fire, the classic medieval hall. Wonderful. Yeah. And then when exactly was the house that I'm seeing now, when was that built? Yeah, so my answer is, so there was a rich wool merchant called Thomas Otley. So in those days, they could make incredible fortunes yes. of wool, believe it or not. And he um, bought the house, in, the, the estate in 1473, um, but obviously didn't start building the house really until about 1549, I believe he started. Very excited to uh, to show you. This is a door that we always used to use. I mean, obviously that's the front door where guests and things come if there's a right. party. But this is like the normal door. <gasps> that's my bedroom up there with the bars and windows. Oh yes, yes. Just stop me falling out. So when you got the keys to the house, so this is 2016, September 28th. You, 25 years later, you get the family house back. You work so hard. You buy it back, and is this? the door you went through or was it, what happened? No, so this is the door and basically, I, I bet I was shaking so much as you can imagine that I couldn't get the key in the knock. And then I was like crying half with joy and half with laughter and half with, I don't know what emotions were going on. It was oh absolutely crazy. I was like literally shaking. Here we go. Oh, so come on in. So this is oh my, gosh. my Usual front door, these are the stairs to my bedroom, this wonderful cantilever staircase where my mum kept all the millions of tins of cat food for our three cats. And so then, you walk in here, you get the keys. This is the very first room I went into. This is our old anti-kitchen. And this is again where we used to have breakfast. But the first thing I saw was obviously the ceiling had collapsed and that was like, oh my goodness. Part of me is I'm thinking, um, having flashbacks, because basically this is one of my favourite rooms. It had copper, beautiful copper pots and pans all around the room, all got sold at the Christie sale. We've no idea who bought those. Um, this incredible, um, you know, range, which is the, very similar to the one at Hampton Court. I don't know, there's so many different feelings, but the most ridiculous thing, and this is what really moved me, is there was a newspaper, my mum and dad's Telegraph newspaper from 1992 still sitting in, in here. It was just, just there. No. Time had stood still. No. It was insane. So you walk through here and you... And there's this newspaper. <gasps> and there's this newspaper, 1992. Oh. Just still no. sitting there. It's just, like, oh, yeah. Said. But just still sitting there. Hadn't moved. Just where my parents left it. As we explore, what's clear is the enormous projects Rowena and James have on their hands. But by opening up part of the house as a holiday let, they hope to fund the repair and restoration of some of these rooms in the former servants' quarters, which hark back to a different era. There would have been gardeners and butlers and right. fish. Um, yeah, of course. And a number of incredible maids and, and wonderful people. This was the um, luggage room to the left here, just the entire room, just dedicated to suitcases. Um, I have been really embarrassed to say this used to be my kind of um, fun room, and I, I did actually, I didn't know what possessed me to paint it this colour, but <laughs> I, as a teenager, I thought that was uh, the thing to do. So you painted this this bright red colour. Oh, no, How so old were you when you painted it? Oh, when I was about 13. <laughs> I thought it was super cool. I had my re record oh. player up here. Fantastic. So this was for you growing up. What did this room represent? Yeah, this was my own space to right. have you know, my friends and just yeah. kind of do whatever I wanted up here. So what, but was it nice to see, I guess, in one sense, when you came up after 25 years, at least the red was still the here. The red was still here. <laughs> I know. I know. The red colour. And then I also love this room for a different reason because there, I was always told that there's this lovely little cubby hole with the window and then my mum's psychic friend um, came and he said that there were these maids totally overexcited because they see that their master's coming home for Christmas. Right, wait, so these were the ghosts? 
I am always fascinated about ghosts because we do have one gray lady in the tutor room at Matt Britton, but how many ghosts do you think you have here? Good ghosts at, at Pitchford. So this will make you laugh. So my, this is a direct quote from my mother. She, she was told that the entire house was stuffed full of ghosts and they were all very lovely ones. <laughs> and they were all very lovely ones. Uh, that Edward, is Edward was the, yes, I, I have smelt, uh, so my step-grandfather smoked these incredibly pungent cigars or cigarillos um, from Latin America. And so very often you get a whiff of the smoke. So I've totally smelt that and that got really excited when I was 13. I smelt the smoke and then you go running off to tell someone because you're so excited. By the time you come back, nothing. Nothing, right, and right. Then, and then Edward, uh, I was in the Great Hall when you saw, well, tell Julie what you saw. Well, the first time I saw a ghost was when I was about four and like someone who was doing work on the house had like just left. And then like, I saw this black figure and I was like, hmm, I said hello to it. And like, it just paused, looked at me, and then like just carried on walking outside of a door. Can it look like Darth Vader? And, <laughs> and then he was a bit rude because he wasn't talking to you. I remember yeah. that. <laughs> For some reason, like ghosts don't come with there's like for more than like one person. I mean, that's what they usually like to do. I mean. They're walking around when like there's no one there because they know they, no, no one's going to see them. Right, exactly. And then maybe they think of like children as won't get as scared, so they come out. Whereas adults can get, I think, yeah. a little. Yeah, I think you're right. It's a maybe good theory. Quite shy. <laughs> yeah, that's a good theory. So Edward, do you ever come up here and play a little bit of hide and seek? Or no, nope. no, nope. <laughs> no, nope. no. Nope. Um, what do you think of the red colour that your mommy painted when she was 13? Um, <laughs> so a bit too red. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what possessed me. <laughs> I think it's brilliant. I thought it was so cool at the time. But where are we in the house? Obviously yeah. the servants, uh, used to be the servants' quarters, but not when you were growing up. Yes, it's really the Victorian wing. And the way I would best describe it is the classic Tudor part is an Elizabethan E-shaped house. And then they added a servants' wing on and it became an F shape. So how many rooms in the house are there? Yeah, it's an excellent question. And I think it's partly a subjective answer, but I'd say maybe like 40 or 50 rooms, but um, now there's 52, because I discovered two more rooms, which I didn't even know about when we got the house back and went round with the children, because they obviously wanted to see every single room and explore every inch of Pitchford. Careful of the dodgy floorboards. I will be careful of the dodgy. Look at, put these. Look at this. This is what we. I mean, this is like. This, you see this? We've got an insane <laughs> amount of work to do. The ceiling. Yes, the ceiling everywhere. But there's something. I know it looks like the ceiling's about to collapse, but it's there's something rather beautiful about it. I completely agree. I mean, my um, <laughs> husband's nephew got married at Pitchford recently. The first wedding we'd had a, since the house had um, had come back. So in 25 years and Gabby, his beautiful wife, had wedding photos taken here and they looked fabulous. Yeah, it's very, I mean, you know, this is what people want. They want this sort of rustic, um, run down, shabby chic, shabby chic <laughs> feel, the ceiling's about to fall through. But no, but this obviously is a lot of work though when you want to. Yeah. No, I mean, it is a huge amount This of is a massive work. amount of work. All right, so what room are we heading I to next? I really, really want to show you this mm -hmm. special room. Mm -hmm. So this is what I was always told. My mum was always fascinated by all the ghosts and everything. We always had lots of wonderful psychic people. And one, oh. so I was always told that this room in here is unbelievable. It's got the, the lady. I can feel it. <laughs> it's got a special, it's, it's, you always feel like I can feel energy. that. I feel, I'm, I haven't, I'm walking into the room now. It feels now. different, doesn't it? Oh my God, I it feel like everything's tingly. It makes I can feel, feel it. it. So Is this weird? It's so bizarre. So the lady who's in here was like the, <gasps> um, the, the head servant lady and she was just apparently this life force, incredible woman, power of positivity and she loved protecting the house and apparently there's an aura of goodness that protects the house oh. and, and this is this, this you can actually feel you that can feel it energy you can feel it and i love that the room is this pink color too because it's sort of a happy color well it is a happy color that looks fun this looks like an old fuse box here i heard the clicking and I had to look over. It's an old fuse box, obviously completely detached. That looks like a fun 
fun project. I think that you can already tell, I've, you know, I've only been here for half a day and I can already feel the good energy, not just in this room, but all around, yeah. all around. You can feel it. And, the, and uh, my great aunt taught me to do water divining and there's just so many incredible things that happen yeah. in Pitchford. In and people just feel alive and happy. I'm just about to meet Rowena and James, and it's a beautiful day. I can see that they're waiting for me there. Oh, they're so lovely. They have some wine waiting for me. We're meeting at the Orangery, which is one of the first buildings James and Rowena restored when they returned to Pitchford. Can I first? I'm going to do lots of these, so I'm going to do one right now because I feel really honored to be here, um, I have to say. And just your story is, I mean, it's one of a kind, remarkable story. And it really sort of tears at your heart when, you know, not when I was walking around with you today. Yeah. And just... I think we can hardly believe it ourselves. Yeah, it's, it's yeah do you still feel sort of five years on? We do, we do. You still kind of pinch yourself at times and think, look, you know, it's, it's been five years. But that, you know, I think it's really important to have that sense of excitement and, and keep on having that sense of excitement. If we ever take Pitchford for granted, that, that is a complete disaster. So yes, but you do now and again have to remind yourself of, of that <laughs> initial kind of excitement. Yeah. when Rowena walked through the door, uh, and, and, you know, after yeah. 25 years. Yeah. You made this pact, you were going to do everything you can to get Pitchford back. Mm. And those 25 years, can you just talk me through really the ups and the downs of it? And did you, did you really feel you could do it? No, I, I, I think there were, there were absolute times when we thought we can do this. And at absolute times when we thought it's never gonna, it just <laughs> not never going to happen, not, not open hell. <laughs> Um, so it, look, it went in kind of waves. We, sometimes we felt kind of confident there were things that were happened. Right. Sometimes we'd hear kind of gossip from, you know, let's say the village or something, and it looked like it, it, it was possible. Right. And other times, yeah, we just thought it's never going to happen and yep. we, we should forget this kind of dream. But we never quite did. Did, yeah. We always knew the estate was a brilliant platform to kind of launch, uh, you know, potentially a bid for the, for the hall. So we spent those 20, 25 years building up the state, doing up derelict uh, buildings, farm buildings, and turning them into kind of holiday cottages. Yes. Trying to make, you know, essentially the funding that would then make uh, going for the hall kind of possible. So yeah, we did. We, sp we spent 20, 25 years just yes. building on that position. Right. Uh, and then, then it eventually happened. Yeah, yeah and, and working full time, both of you. Oh no, yeah. that was a very, really important part of it. <laughs> yes. We spent most weekends up here, and what was absolutely brilliant is though we, so many of our friends were part of that hope so they'd come up we'd have we start off with the lodge my mum let James and I have the lodge as our weekend thing and then we eventually turned that into a holiday let that was the very first commercial thing when my um you know after my parents and everything but the um the the joy of the friends willing us on is what I was thinking about the impetus and yes everyone rooting for us basically yes. which was really special yeah no I mean the, I mean again it's the most remarkable you know story of saving and getting back the the lost family home well cheers to both of you because this is just the start i can feel that and i cannot wait to explore more and see what you both have done oh no, thank you very much cheers. thank you Pitchford Hall, to me, is the most remarkable story I've ever heard of a historic house being saved by the family. I mean, it's inspiring to hear James and Rowena talk about the 25 years that they took and worked towards getting the family house back is inspiring in itself. But now they're on this different journey and it's about getting the treasures back, but also making sure that this survives for generations to come. What they have done to save this historic house, it will be talked about for years and years to come. 
Pitchford Hall is layered in history, with much of the building constructed in the 16th century, during the Elizabethan era when this beautiful half-timbered style was the height of fashion. I attended the first day of the, of the sale. Here? There were two days, oh there were two goodness. days, and I went to the, to, to the first day. And all, I mean, everything, pretty well everything was sold on, on, that, on that day. And everything would go out, let's say, say that lamp or the court cupboard, would go out of that door, go into the marquee, go to the auctioners kind of thing, and, and, and the gavel would come down and that's oh gone. My. And this is our kind of Bible of, of what happened in 1992 in terms of the Kip Christie's catalog. Right. And so how many items are there? A I mean, it's thousand. a thick book. Yeah, it's a that huge is book. A thick. So how many there items in total? A thousand and forty-seven a thousand lots. And forty-seven. Um, so yeah, that's why it's two days. Oh my goodness, that just gives me chills. It was it was a bizarre atmosphere of, in a way, it's quite a social event yeah. because people were interested in uh, you know what was happening at, at Pitchford, uh, and you had hundreds and hundreds of people. <gasps> And everyone, in a sense, wanted to kind of own a, a piece of a piece of Pitchford. You're on a treasure hunt now. You've you've it, got the house back. Yeah. You know the house yep. itself, the walls of the house back. It's now starting yep. to yep. fill it with the yep. treasures that it once had. And what has that process been like? Yeah, look, I, a treasure hunt is absolutely right. That's that's exactly what we feel. And I look, I look at I look at a piece of furniture just over there, and that came back from Shropshire. It was about 20 miles uh, from here. It was owned by a woman who was downsizing and she wanted it to go back to, to, to Pitchford. So, you know, every room I go into now, I can see these objects from, from the treasure hunt yes. that have returned. How many of the 1,047 objects do you think you now have in possession? I think it's probably only about 50. So oh there's, my a, goodness. there's a huge treasure hunt ahead of us. For James, of the thousand or so pieces still to find, there's one in particular which he would love to see back at Pitchford. There are a number of items that, that you know, I feel really important to me. And there was one that was the uh, cabinet table. So it was, in, it was in number 10 Downing Street. It was used as, you know, Gladstone, the prime minister, uh, as his kind of cabinet table. And it was given to, I think uh, it was through the Lord Rosebery family. And Lord Rosebery family was a, a British prime minister and his daughter owned Pitchford, Lady, Lady Sybil Grant. Oh, yes, so yes. that feels like, you know, I'm very interested in politics, I work in politics. Yeah. Having, having that cabinet table back is really important uh, to us. And there's one painting by the early 19th century artist, James Ward, which would have pride of place back here. So it's only, it's only really good painting that has kind of Pitchford Hall in it. Now it's also got uh, a horse, a beautiful horse, but obviously we're interested in, in uh, Pitchford Hall. And the, the, this is it in the Christie's catalogue by James Ward, uh, painted in 1822. I assume, and I'm not sure if the artist ever uh, you know, came to Pitchford because it's a slightly different landscape, but I, I assume he kind of romanticised the landscape. But the importance for us is, it's just a wonderful picture of, of Pitchford Hall with the smoke kind of billowing out of the many chimneys at, at, at Pitchford. Yes, but this horse, it's, this is for me, this in one way or another represents the Queenie Princess. It does, and it's, the so, horse. it's so true. And it's all of a sudden the horse yeah. is looking on. Yeah, it's startlingly, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's incredibly un... ironic because it, is. it calls, I mean, the, the, the painting is a, a bear Arab uh, horse and it looks exactly like the horses that the Kuwaiti, previous Kuwaiti yes, owner yes. Uh, had, at, had at Pitchford. And, and you're absolutely right, it's looking uh, yeah, slightly askance yes, yes, uh, and, at, and... at us. As word gets out that James and Rowena are on a treasure hunt to restore the family collection to Pitchford, people have come forward with some of the pieces sold in 1992. And there was one particular lady who said, look, I've got the painting. Let's work towards you kind of getting it back. And these, these things take time. Yes. They're not necessarily easy. Um, and the funding wasn't there. You know, we didn't have the funding no. to pay for that painting. 
And amazingly, I did during um, lockdown, uh, like, like you did, we did a few kind of virtual, virtual tours. And there was a, um, a man from Texas, from Houston in, in Texas, yeah. who we did a virtual tour with. And I mentioned the importance of the Jenkins and Barb painting to Pitchford. And he said, um, James, I'll, I'll, buy, I'll buy it back for you. No. <laughs> yes. And you've never met him. But he just said, look, James, I'll, I'll, oh my goodness. I'll give you the money. That just gave me chills. That is incredible. So do you have, is, where is the painting now? Uh, um, we are going to, uh, going to uh, hang it. Hang it? Yeah. Okay. Is it here? Yeah, you know, it's, it, it, it's, in the, oh. it's, in the, it's in the porch. So I get to, can I, can I help a little bit? Yeah, no, well, I love you too. I love you. Oh. We, hey, we need it. It's quite oh a big, it's quite a big painting. I am so happy I'm actually here on a day that, you know, a no, treasure no, no, gets to be hung and be seen. This is it, everybody. The moment has arrived. One of the big treasures is just about to come through the door and we're going to hang it. And this is so exciting for me and for James and Rowena. Uh, an incredible, incredible story of a treasure being recovered. Yay! Here it is. This is so exciting. Oh Here we go, Judy. Wow. Holy cow. Oh my goodness. How do you feel, right? <laughs> well, look, I, we, we've spent, you know, five years <laughs> trying to get this painting back in to the hall and it hadn't, hadn't been in. You know, right. this left in 1992. Okay, we're just going to hang it in the, in the drawing room. Yep, in the drawing room. Very gently. Beautiful. Um, it's, oh my gosh, it's giving me chills. But it's such a, it's such a prominent yeah, painting. It okay, mm -hmm. shall I? Yeah. I might learn something here as well, how to hang. <laughs> well, we're, yeah, Rupert's the, Rupert's the expert and it's, it's helped us kind of hang all the yes. paintings in the, in the house. Now, do you want me to help at all? Do you need me to hold anything? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah? Just, just stabilize it would be okay. just great. Thank you. Yeah, 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 of course, of course. Ready? Yeah. Let's see. Hang on, let me do double check. Yeah. Should be on that J hook. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Can I let go at the bottom yes. here? Yeah. You're fine. <laughs> I know you just. Oh my goodness. Okay. It's best to level it by eye anyway, because nothing's straight in this house. So. Exactly. Okay, let's go back and see. It looks, I mean, wonderful. Just, you know what, out of all the paintings that were sold in, in the Christie's, you know, having this one. Is that exactly, it, it, exactly. Now, because yeah. there's life in this house yeah. again. Yeah. And that represents the smoke coming out of the chimney. It's, life has returned. Then, I meet up with Rowena to visit someone very special who has kept the spirit of Pitchford alive for over 30 years. So, we're heading off to, you, um, is it Violet? Is so, right? so, this is um, the North Lodge where Vic and Vi, very, very sadly, Vic um, unfortunately died quite recently, but we were so, so fond of him. But Vic and Vi have been here forever. They're absolutely sort of the earth, the most wonderful people. She's like my granny. <laughs> And they used to look after us in the good old days when we had Pitchford. So they know my mum and dad. They call my mum Mrs. C, my dad Mr. C, and they're just brilliant. And I can't wait for you to meet Vi because she's such a character and she knows everything about the ghost, my parents. I mean, she's fabulous. <gasps> there's Vi, Hello. there's Vi. Oh, hi, Vi. This is Julian. This I'm is Vi Roberts. Hi. So <laughs> nice to meet you. I've heard so much about you. We were just oh, walking down. Oh, I hope down. it was good. Um, it was all good. Oh, good. How long have you been here at Pitchford? Uh, since 1989. Okay, right. Mm. So you've so you've seen it when obviously Rowena's parents were here. Oh yes. And then three years later, 1992, yeah. it was sold. Mm. And was that? Do you remember what that happening and what oh, was yes. going on? Oh yes. And it was horrible. Yeah. Over those 25 years, who was looking after the house? 
thick and by. <gasps> they were the custodians. You were the custodians. Mm. So you would go in and do what you could just to make sure that it was still standing, really? Well, the, we couldn't do much because there was no furniture in there. Right. So there wasn't an awful lot we could do but fight dust. Fight dust. And that was a continual battle. Yes. Uh, but um, apart from that, we kept the rats out and we kept the mice out. And, <laughs> but right. it was deteriorating rapidly. We could see it. It was breaking my heart. Yes. To see it falling apart. Yeah, I kept saying to her, for God's sake, raise the money and buy it back. <laughs> right. <laughs> did you think that that was possible? Did you think? Because when I was speaking to Oh, her, I knew they would. You did. You did. Mm, I'd got faith in them. I knew they would. So how is it now just having Rowena and James's children around? So you've got Edward, Serena and Georgiana. Does it, is it feeling like because of, of course it feels like it's back to life, but for you, having seen these changes, the sadness of the of the cell of the house. Yes, but you do. Um, you look positive now. Yeah. Um, that's gone. Yes. Yes. I want to ask both of you, um, and it would be interesting to see if it's the same or if it's different. But if you could, if there's a room in the house that is just your favorite room. I know I have one at Mapperton. Mine is actually a loo. <laughs> I love that, I love that. I'm obsessed with the Thunderbox loo room <laughs> at Mapperton, and I think it's because as an American, we don't really have Thunderbox's loo, but all in that loo we've decorated with all of the Earl of Sandwich oh, brilliant. Um, brilliant. painting, well, sort of pictures if you like. Yeah, but is there yeah. a room in Pitchford that holds some great memory, <laughs> fond memories Home for you? Kitchen kitchen <laughs> definitely my kitchen. I took you know, the yeah. oven the tea ovens are still there and I can still picture you making all that amazing food and that terrible time where the whole thing roast fell on the floor <laughs> what happened there that was a disaster Ponta oh, beat me to it though didn't he <laughs> <laughs> the, the Labrador the Labrador grabbed hold of this leg of lamb and took off with it <laughs> It was nightmare. <laughs> Luckily, I got another piece of meat in the, in the fridge, thawing out for it the next day. And I had to grab that and tell them, lunch will be a little late. <laughs> for me, I think it depends what mood you're in. I mean, I love the attic, and sometimes if I'm in a contemplative mood, I'll go up there, or the great hall with that roaring fire, it's fantastic. Or obviously my bedroom, um, my parents' room. I don't know, I, I find it yeah, impossible it just to give one yeah, room. Yeah, it's so true. And, and, and the Life Force Lady Room, that I go in there, I love that one. Yeah. I love the whole house, yeah. I don't you, know what to you, say. Yeah, no, okay, well don't. But you've given mm. some great examples. <laughs> I know it would be so hard. I think for me, because if I were to ask my husband the same question, yeah, if he had to pick a room, I think he would choose, like you, yeah. it just depends yeah. on on the mood that yeah. he's in because he yeah. grew up in that house. And what do you feel would be, I guess, a hope for you and what you, how you would see Pitchford in the future? It's going to go from strength to strength, there's no doubt about that. But I don't suppose I shall still be around, but I'd love to see that little boy taking over here. Oh, boy, oh. Yeah, oh. I, I won't be around, oh. but I'll be looking down. Oh, oh boy, oh, oh. <laughs> oh you were just... <laughs> oh, I got oh. tears in my eyes, oh. <laughs> yeah. But you will be around, you'll just be in a... A different place. In a different place, yeah. but you'll still be here. Yeah. <laughs> Pitchford Hall is layered in history, with much of the building constructed in the 16th century, during the Elizabethan era when this beautiful half-timbered style was the height of fashion. It may look stunning, but it needs a lot of repair and restoration. I hear you're going to be putting me to work. Yes. First of all, we've got to spray down this uh, exposed panel that's failed, because lime needs lots of water. So okay, so I'm just going to have to have you back completely up because you're the professional yeah. and I'm not. Tell me a little bit about the history of this exterior and what it takes to repair it. Well, it's, I mean, it's, this house has you know, been built over many years, but uh, this bit's Elizabeth in this section. Right. And uh, it's in a bit of a poor state, unfortunately. Yes. It's not much what was done for 20 years, so... Uh, it's uh, an ongoing thing. Every summer we, we start and keep going, and then uh, 
down tools for the winter. And here you are again. So yeah. how many years have you been working well, on I've been Pitchford? on this for five years. Five I started years. on the medieval section, which is just over there. Right. Um, which has been turned into a holiday let. Yes, yes. It's so it can pay its way. So you're now on the Elizabethan part of yeah. the house. And what are you doing exactly? What are you repairing? I'm repairing all the plaster panels. Um, cause right. They're, they've been repaired with varying different materials. So we're putting it back using the, the right stuff, ah. the, the right techniques. So it will last because the wrong stuff, like cement and other things, it just uh, damages the timbers because the building can't breathe. That's why we use the lime. It would have all originally been lath. The brick infill was just done because it was easier. Now it's explain to me lath off. because... The lath is a wooden cut or split and it's um, timbers like um, such as beech or oak that split and you leave the small gaps right. and then you press the plaster in and yes. the plaster falls through the back and we call those snots. Okay. In, 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 in the, in the, <laughs> so they, they just dro they droop through and then once it's, it sets it's, that's the key, it goes rock hard. And it goes rock hard. And you build it up over layers. Right. Whereas the brick infill there was done much later because it's easier. Because each, each slat has to be nailed in and it's so... But right. the problem that you have with the brick is it puts a lot more weight on the building. So you're here on the Elizabethan part now. I see you've got... The, that's the lath there. That's original. Ah. Because they are just hand split sections. So you today and well, for the past yeah. five years, you're taking off the paneling. Yeah, that's failing. That's failing. And, the, when, and where the wrong materials have been used. Big question for you. How, do you call them panels? Yeah. yeah. How many panels have you restored so far? I did the other side as well, hundreds. <laughs> yeah, hundreds. And how, and how many more do you have to go? Thousands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. There's a lot. It's 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 all over. But we, all... We, we're just prioritising the, the, the stuff that's really failing. That's, that's letting water in. So you will repair all of that. No, you will. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to put me to work? Yes. Okay. So what do I? What do first you thing need is, to do? And what do I first need thing, to do? Lime needs lots of water because it's not like cement, which is, which is a chemical reaction. Lime reacts with the atmosphere. So okay. It needs to stay wet. So my first task is to dampen the area we're going to be working on. All of it. Yeah. Inside. So I can definitely see through here. Yeah. I can see the Just, interior wall, right? Yeah. And then the space in between. How am I doing, Nick? Good. Yeah. Just make sure you get the edges of the timber because it, oh, yeah. it's very dry timber and that will suck the moisture out of the plaster as it goes in and dry it out too quickly. And what about the timber on the inside there? That's fine, there? No, just leave that, don't worry okay. about that. It will get wet, but it'll dry. Okay, okay. I see. Then it's time to prepare the lime itself with one key ingredient which will help fix it to the timber. Yeah, well, lime's quite, it's, it's pretty strong, but we want to bind it together. And the hair, all the fibres, give it its strength. So even if it cracks, like you can see all these cracks, it won't fall out because there's thousands of hairs in there that just, it's like, fi it's like fiberglass, so it's right. the same sort of principle. So oh here we've got, this is, this is a lime plaster okay. that was um, made from uh, lime putty yep. and uh, sand. And then this is the hair here. This is, this, I had, you get it no, in these, I had no idea. You get it in these rounds. <laughs> this, this is um, Chinese yak hair, okay. it's goat hair, horse hair. Anything's good, really. So what you have to do yeah. is sprinkle it bit by bit. Oh my goodness. I... So if you want to, and then In... you have to hand turn it. You can't mix it with the, mechanically because the hair just binds round and you end up with a big, ball, like a fur ball. And how do you know how much hair to put in here? Uh, obviously a lot more. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I'll... I'll be... You tell me. And can I just ask you now that we're mixing, how did you, get into this line of work because you know the thing about is these historic it. houses yeah. is the, the craftsmen and just, you're far and few between these well I know I just the thing is I, I like I specialize because I just love old buildings in a right. perfect place to work perfect place to work yeah we forget all these wonderful traditions and the way that things you know were made you know I think hundreds we're ready years now. ago this you scoop is, a little bit up yeah you just get it on the trowel and you press that in gently because what we want to do, we want to press this through the laths so they form those uh, snots, as we said. Yeah. And then just Yeah, I have going. to have you watch. I have to, you have to do it first. I've got to see okay. this first. Right. I cannot do this by myself. So I'll just get a little bit <laughs> I on. I cannot mess uh, this up. 
<laughs> I'll never be asked back. Oh my goodness. So I, mean, I just wiggle it on and it's the first bit you press in. So it's almost, so I know that that's gone through there because it's only very thin. And we'll add more to that. Okay. The plaster can't fall through because the hair is attaching it to the rest of it. So even when you've got big gaps there, it will fill it. Oh my gosh. So once we get it like that, we'll then build it up just a few more mil. And right. then you have a different type of plaster goes on the top. I'll and how long does it take for this to dry? Um, well, it's not the drying we want. Oh. It, it's the chemical process. We want, oh. it, we want it, the, the, the carbonation to, to, to happen. To happen. So I'll be able to top coat this maybe in about three or four days. Right, right. So I'll co we'll cover it with a sheet. We'll wet the sheet too because we don't want it to dry. Because if it dries, ah. it cracks it, and it literally will start to fall out. It'll start to fall out. Yeah. I see. All right. Let this me... is why people use cement to cut corners because it goes off in a few hours and it's hard the next day. Right. Whereas this takes three to four days. You can't rush it. Right, it's, it's, right. So I'll hold that. Okay. Guys, that's your... Okay. Oh dear. Okay. Don't worry. It's, it... I can't mess it up. <laughs> I'll put some on your trowel for okay. you then. Okay. This is, I have to say, one of the most exciting things I've done. I know that sounds crazy. So, you... I guess I just tilt it when you get it on there. Just... And go up above here. Yeah. yeah? Tilt. Yeah. And just, and just push it gently up. push that up. That's it. Perfect. All right. And that's it. And you keep adding, adding, adding. Okay. And you build up the layers. Oh, it's, you know, it's wonderfully soft. So do you want me to go up? Yeah, keep, yeah, keep going. This is so much fun, but thank goodness I'm under the careful guidance of Nick, who specializes in these traditional techniques. This has got quite a lot of hair in it because we've got some big gaps here and you can also use it to repair the holes in the timbers. So we'll add even more hair because then they, this can be coloured and stained to, to match. It's quite satisfying. It is. It's really satisfying. Sorry, that was a bit messy. No, there's no, it, it mess is fine. Okay. Yep. Okay. Oops. Gosh, I, I want to make it perfect, but I guess it doesn't matter. Sign your name in it, so. Put your, put your initials. <laughs> can I? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna do JH, everybody, for Hinchingbrook. Somehow Hinchingbrook needs to live on, so I'll sign it with JH, Julie Hinchingbrook. Oh my gosh, thanks. Thanks, Nick. It's rather exciting. It's left for three or four days, then another layer is applied before it's covered in five coats of lime wash. You certainly need to be patient in this job. What we were just doing over there yeah. is this yeah. finished. When I apply the top coat. When you apply the yeah, top coat, right, yeah. that is that finished. Yeah. And then you have to cover so it's, it up. It's three, it's three processes, really. It's base coat, top coat, and lime wash. And lime wash. OK. Now, you have these are all covered up here. Yeah, it's, just, it's because it's sunny and it's, and it's hot. Right. And again, it's just like the lime wash, because it's made from the same stuff. If it dries too quickly, it fails. It fails. <gasps> and I'll, this will be soaked tonight with the uh, water, so. So you'll soak it again yeah. with water. So should we pin this one yeah, back I'll up? Yeah, tack that up. And these have all had the same first coat down here. These have yeah. all been first coated by you throughout. Yeah, they were done today. There's, right. Yeah, yeah. So how much, so those, were, you've done one coat, and then how long do you have to wait to do the next coat and then the next coat and then the next coat till you get four to five? Um, probably a day, a day or so, Dad. two days, I would. Oh my goodness. You can, you can tell really, it, 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 it's just, it's, it's no, the, the elements decide it as well. So right. it's, it's, you just gotta right. just so touch it. Right, so it's a it. long process. Yeah, and this is, why it's, this is why restoration is expensive. And that's why so many people cut corners using the wrong materials because you could do this in cement and have it painted with a, with a masonry paint in, you know, two days. Right. Whereas this is... It takes weeks, yeah. Yeah. Now, I also hear that there is another project that you're working on yeah. that has a royal connection. Yeah. Is that right? Yes. Can I come visit you later? Yes, of course. Okay. Yeah.
One of the things about historic houses is that they usually come with a lot of other buildings. And back in the day, those other buildings would be used really for the family or for the staff, but times have changed. These historic houses have to find new ways to generate income. And so here we are at Pitchford, and you can see I'm walking through what really were the old stables, but now they've been repurposed by James and Rowena into workshops. And I can really relate to this because it's the same thing at Mapperton. We have old buildings down there that we need to repurpose and use them in a way that will help generate income for the estate. So I'm heading now off to see uh, a sculpture here, and I believe it's this one right here. Hello. Hello. Michael, I was told to find you here. Um, I'm Julie. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much. I've just been um, looking around the stable yard mm -hmm. and how it's been repurposed yes. into yeah. these wonderful workshop spaces. Yes. I've been here six months or less in terms of actually working here. And um, in that time, all the other spaces have filled up. Right. So it's an incredible hub of people now. And it's, uh, it's just really exciting. <laughs> you, stand, you, know, you go outside the doors and you, you bump into the next person and you know, they're making something, they're creating something. something. So, yeah, it's really filled, filled up and it's um, yeah, lo lovely place. Is this your space to kind of create yeah. and... Yeah, escape to and create, yes. So talk me through though the process. It starts with a uh, series of drawings, really. Um, there's a lot of research that goes into the sculpture, uh, both in terms of context, how it will sit in its final position, and, and also because it's a Michael, you know, the symbolism and key features that I might want to pull into the piece. So how tall will the final piece be? So the final piece is going to be 1.3 meters. Right. And... It's um, a little bit less than me, so that's yeah. quite big. There it we is. go. Yes, yes, yes. And it will actually stand um, a couple of almost, I think it's what, about 1.5 meters off the ground on ah. a plinth, a one side of the chancel arch for a church just outside of London. There is such a creative community here at Pitchford and wonderful spaces still to be developed and restored. Where are we now? This is um, where the farrier used to um, <gasps> operate. No. Um, there is talk of getting someone in to come and do and get, the, get, it, get it working again, but it actually does all as a small <gasps> hole. Look at this bellow. Is that a bellow? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Excuse oh the, the scaffold. my goodness. And obviously, it was operated by Harry. No. And it, Look at this. It needs tuning, but it does. It does work. Here, I'm going to yeah. give Harry's bellow a blow. Oh my gosh, I've never. Do these still exist, these big bellows? R rare as hen's teeth. That's what uh, I was yeah. about to say. Oh my goodness. This is incredible. Yeah. Oh, and that's the bench for... That's for... The... Yeah, there would have been an anvil here as well. Yes. Because that's, <gasps> see, a very heavy duty. Right. So this is, this is an opportunity for yeah. an artist to come in here and... Yeah, and maybe do courses in metal do work. Do courses. And... Fantastic. That was fun. All right, I see some bits right there. Yeah. That makes me think... Lime washing. <laughs> We're on to do some more. Yeah. So where are we heading to now? This is um, a tree house. Um, okay. And noted to be the, the oldest one in the world. What? The oldest tree house in the world. My understanding is that this was um, Queen Victoria. She, had, when had she stayed here? Yeah, she, yeah, when she stayed here. She stayed in the main house and... Uh, and she took tea here. Yeah. And it's the oldest tree house in the world. It is. And we're going to repair it. <laughs> well, it, yeah, it's, it's been unsensitively repaired in the past, so... Uh, so you've got the scaffolding up, I see. Yeah. Fantastic. S similar work going on as, as down at the main hall that we saw earlier. Ah, so you've got... Remind me what the... That's laugh. Laugh. That, that's, that's it. That's new stuff I'm putting in, because someone had put steel mesh and had used cement. So oh. I've removed that. The tree. Oh my goodness! And why is there metal? There's massive. There's lots of holes. I mean, it, it is it is like a zoo in there. There's that many animals <laughs> living in it. So, uh, and it's it's hollow. It's grown. It's fallen down. Oh it's my goodness! But yeah, but it's still. Yeah, it's a lime tree. 
Yeah, it's it, lovely. It's, it has a lot of mistletoe on it last year. It's all been removed. Oh, it's beautiful. All right, should we go up? Yep. Okay. Right. Yeah, I quite like this scaffolding. I feel like I could do some acro yoga on this. Yep. No, come on up. Okay, great. Before we start to lime wash, there's obviously a drone right yeah, there. Right. We can wave to everybody. Because <laughs> there wasn't enough room up yeah. for um, the entire crew. Right, so tell me, Nick, what we're going to do now. This is lime washing. So yep. it, it, as we said before, it needs five coats, well, three, four to five ideally. So this has had one. Right. So it needs to be wetted down to, to help the, the chemical um, reaction and then um, and then we can paint it. I, before we start, the one thing I do want to point out, which I think is fascinating for me to see, and I think probably for um, everybody else, is that you almost have the different stages here. Yeah. So you have the lar... This, this is oak. Oh, this is oak, from, right. From, from the estate. And then these are stainless steel screws. Yep. So there'll be no corrode. It, it, it should not need repairing for right. a, a very long time. And then this is what we did earlier on the yeah, house. Yeah, that's ready for its top coats. Right. And then it'll need to be lime washed like these. And it'll be right. Oh my goodness, because I can see the hair. So okay. if you want to give it a spray. Oh my gosh! Wow. And you can see it. Almost, it'll start to look like this. Yes. Yes. That's an, yeah. So you have four more coats really yeah, to right, do. Yeah, that's an, that's it. Is that it's enough? Great, yeah. And then? And then this is the lime wash. Oh, it's, it's like the consistency of, like I said, single cream. Yes, it is. It's exactly so like single cream. It does flick cream. everywhere, so be careful. Okay. And then just, I work from the top because it drips. Right. Don't try and work it in too much because you can, you can remove. Ah, what, what has already, because it's wet. Yeah, because it, well, it's, it's the, other, the other one's still reacting. So I do that to, if you want to have a go. Okay, and you go I'll, side I'll hold to the, side. Yes, yeah, so I just, and just let it let it run down. Okay. So you start on the top and work your way down. It doesn't matter if too much if it goes on the oak because when I'm, when it's finished, we'll use a wire brush on all the oak just to clean oh, you it will. up. I was going to so, ask so you. So that. that will all. Okay. It's quite because it's so runny. It's quite hard to not get it on. Yeah, it is so runny. And it looks like you're painting nothing. It looks like yeah, you're not so doing anything. Weird. But weird. It has that lovely chalky yeah. look. Yeah. yeah. What do you think? Do you think I've done yeah, it? That's it. Should I hand you this? Do you want to go first? Yeah, I'll, we'll just reverse what we okay, did. Okay, yeah. And... Like many historic houses, Pitchford has hosted the royal family over the years. In 1935, the future King George VI and Queen Elizabeth visited, and back in 1832, the then Princess Victoria spent time here. Okay. James is showing me a very special room in the family wing of the hall where Victoria stayed. I think it's wonderful, James, <laughs> that you have this big connection with Queen Victoria. Yeah. You know. So. <laughs> she's the second most popular queen, right? <laughs> right. So look, th this is where we think she, she slept. <sighs> and, you know, over, over the years, there, there are a number of kind of guides that have been done for Pitchford. Right, And some right. quite, you know, quite a long time ago, near, obviously nearer her, her stay. And they describe, you know, her being in this room you know, really, really well. I'm just coming, I just love all the carvings. So they- yeah. I mean, one of my theories is, I think that face looks like, if you look at what Queen Victoria or Princess Victoria looked like when she was a 13 year old girl, when she visited Pitchford in 1832, that's what she looks like. Right, right. Now, so many people think I'm talking absolute rubbish here, but I think if you had, if Victoria had visited Pitchford, you know, that's something you celebrate. Of course. And you know, my, my view is that they have planted this on, on, the, on the fireplace, just, just as a kind of yes. reminder or, or kind of, uh, 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 you know, just remembering the fact that Victoria was in, this, with, was in this room in October, November, you know, on a cold, cold night in Shropshire in, in 1832. There is a similarity to 
to Queen Victoria. And, and you know, we also have to remember that when royalty visits these yes. historic houses, it's all about celebrating them and making sure that there's some type of memorabilia, if you like, That's of, right. of That's that right. visit. That's so, right. you know, I look back at Hinchingbrook, and of course, there's the bow window for Queen Elizabeth the yeah. visit, and and there it is, 1562, yeah. and it was yeah. made after she came, but in celebration that she had that, been that's, there. That's right. So that, that's why my that's why I think right. I'm right. Yes. But everyone thinks I'm wrong. I'm I'm in agree uh, with good, you. Good, I, good, I think you're good, right. Good. I think it was her mother who apparently drew her bed up towards the fire. Right. To keep warm at night. And poor Princess Victoria was apparently pushed <laughs> towards the end of this room, <laughs> you know, where it wasn't so right. where it wasn't so warm. And um, there's a little line on the ceiling, and oh, yes. what we think is there was there was a, a another room, ah. no windows, pretty airless. That Victoria and, and very cold. That Victoria would have would have stayed in for the five nights she stayed at Pitchford, and then her mother had you know this room and, and right. the kind of warmer warmer the warmer room. part. Right. And if you remember, there wasn't a great relationship between mother and and, and you know thirteen year old princess yes. at the time. So that kind of makes sense to to me. So. Just looking at kind of around the room, there are things that kind of, you know, helps you understand, yes, it helps you understand. the relationship. I find it endlessly fascinating to read the architectural clues left in the fabric of these historic homes. And at Pitchford, there is a rare secret room called a priest's hole, where visiting priests would hide during the English Reformation of the 16th century. Is it so, in here? Yeah, yeah, I mean... You try, try and find it, but I'll, I'll give you, okay. give you, a, give you a bit of a hint that it's in this, this in this kind of broad area. But is there a door? There yeah. is a door. Yeah, there is a door. So and it's not, it's not a trap door. It's not, it's not on the, it's not on the floor. It, okay. 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 I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. I think. Maybe. You're doing. I mean, you're doing well. You did. There's a little <laughs> lever to. Yeah. You're almost oh. there. You're almost there. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. That's it. Oh my that's gosh. It. That's it. That's no. It. No. So this is the priest. Oh my gosh. So it's quite <gasps> a No. It's quite a large priest hole. Or, or Pope's hole, let's say it's this... called. Go down. Oh, really? Go down, okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll hold the trap okay, door. Okay, hold me the trap door. Okay, everybody. I'm descending. The priest hole. Wow. <gasps> There's windows down here. Yeah. Okay, so, so there are very, very few priest holes in this in this country with you know windows. <laughs> yep. And we we think it is um Rowan always describes it as kind of false window. So we think maybe it maybe it's boarded up or there was some vegetation outside that basically disguised it. But I must admit, if I was in a priest hole and there were a whole bunch of soldiers trying to find me, I'd quite like an escape route. Yes. And this this provides uh, an, an escape route. Um, but so, it is it is a past, you know. But was this created well. during the Reformation? So, so it, no, you're absolutely right. So, so there was a woman called uh, Mary Otley who who lived here in the kind of late late fifteens, early sixteens, and she was obviously a recent, and you know she worshipped the Catholic faith, um, and you know they, I'm sure she would have had priests there, yes. and she needed to protect them, uh, and right. and that that you know that window I think is actually quite important. <gasps> Very important. But they're very few. I think there are only about three in the country that That's... actually have a kind of additional kind of access route. Of Normally course. it would just be a small priest hole and you'd be you know, yeah. claustrophobic. And, right, and no, you'd, no, you'd exactly. be stuck. If they found you, you'd be stuck. Oh my goodness, it's incredible. It's absolutely, that was incredible. I mean, literally, I've first of all, I've never seen a priest hole in a historic house. So that was sensational, but also just seeing the windows, they're open there. Wow. I'm on my way to the treehouse. But again, this just isn't any ordinary treehouse. This is the world's oldest treehouse. And also in 1832, Queen Victoria wrote in her diary that she walked the grounds here at Pitchford, went up the stairs to a house on top of a tree. And that is where I'm going to right now. I'm gonna have tea with Georgiana that's Rowena and James's eldest daughter, and I'm really looking forward to it. Hi! Hi. I got 
to give you a hug. <laughs> um, I've heard all about you um, from your parents, and then I also realized that you're the same age as my number three. I have four children, and you're the same age as my number three. <laughs> so, so um, uh, this is such a magical place. I've already spent so much time here, and still lots more to do, but it's a magical place. It is, especially here, up in the trees. I know, it's incredible. So, Queen Victoria, she was actually here, where, we're, so, where, we're, where we are now. While you're sitting, Queen Victoria was in this area. Um, so, on the 27th of October in 1832, she was on her tour of the realm when she was 13, and she stayed at Pitchford for five days, and then recorded the whole stay in her diary. And she describes going up to a little house in the tree, um, playing the harp with Lady Louisa Jenkinson, who lived in the house at the time, visiting the old dairy. And so it's just amazing to like, see into the like, life of a 13-year-old princess. So was this tree house already here? For... So, yeah, this is the oldest tree house in the world. Right. So it was built between <laughs> um, 1650 and 1670. And then it first appeared on the map in 1682. You're kidding me. <laughs> oh my goodness. We, so I kind of feel very special right now because I'm obviously in the oldest tree house in the world and I'm in the tree house that Queen, Queen Victoria yeah. was in. Yeah. So when you were growing up, you, obviously you were told stories about mm -hmm. Pitchford. So yeah. because obviously when you were born, it had been sold. Your parents only had just the surrounding yeah. estate. But what other stories, you were, you were told obviously the story of Queen Victoria coming yeah. here and that this being the oldest tree house in the world. But what other stories were you told of um, here at Pitchford that you can remember before you yeah. got the house back? Well, I've always been really intrigued because I would be hearing about this woman called Lady Sybil Grant. And so she was, um, she lived in the house, but she didn't like the sound of running water and she was afraid of being so close to the graveyard because of the ghosts. <laughs> And so she converted the orangery and she literally lived between the orangery and the tree house. You're kidding me. <laughs> no. So she didn't live in the No, she, she in completely moved out. Her husband lived, you can see his like win his room window through there. Yes. And she would communicate to him via semaphore um, through or megaphone through the window. Oh, and then <laughs> megaphone. <laughs> yeah. And then occasionally they would meet for afternoon tea on the lawn. But um, every morning, her maid would bring up her boiled egg on a silver salver to the treehouse. So she spent a lot of time up here. <laughs> <laughs> so she was very eccentric. Right. And um, so also, she dyed her hair with henna. So it was bright orange. And she would tell fortunes. So there would be fairs at Pitchford, and she would tell fortunes on the lawn. So you grew up with these stories being told mm -hmm. to you by your parents. Yeah. And because obviously your mom grew up here but you weren't able to go into the house. No. You just saw it from a distance. So we would like quite often walk past and we would see it over the river and it would just be like really dreamlike, like imagining, I would always imagine what it would be like to like live in the house and my mum would just be telling me all these stories. And so it was like always a dream to get it back. Like, right, yeah. So it was like a childhood fairy tale, but I never thought it would actually happen. Right, <laughs> And no. so now like all the time, my whole family have to like, completely like pinch ourselves every day that we're actually like here. And were you here when she went into the house? So oh. basically we came back, um, the first weekend we got it back immediately, we came up, the whole house was completely empty. Like there was nothing, no electrics, no water, like absolutely nothing, just cobwebs, layers <gasps> of dust. And so, but we were determined to see, sleep the first night. So we all came, <laughs> um, it was like amazing and unlocking the door, I still remember. And um, then we basically spent the next few months mopping every weekend, like, and cleaning. It was in 2016. Right. So I'm 17 now. I think I was, I think I was about the same age as Queen Victoria. Right. So I remember okay, feeling yes. Yes, exactly. connected to the tree house whenever I was in <laughs> thinking exactly. that she was like my age when she'd visited, and it was really, yeah. I love being in this tree house and then hearing the stories of Queen Victoria and Lady Sybil, but I have to ask, once you got the house back, mm -hmm. Was this one of the first places you went yeah. to? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I like, I just love this. It's like such a quiet space, but it's also like you feel really connected because it's so old and like you think about all the stories of all the different people up here. And I think, yeah, it's amazing. I, I like to come up here and like read or have a little tea parties. Yeah. And so, and also the view. It's just the view. like 
it over to look at everything and look back at the house. So I, yeah, I love art pillar. <laughs> Now, I love a cold water dip, and for those of you who don't know about my love of cold water immersion therapy, let's just say I take every opportunity to plunge into freezing cold water. At Mapperton, we are restoring the 18th century pool with the generous donations from our patrons of Mapperton Live. And here at Pitchford, Rowena is taking me to the Victorian plunge pool. But just a reminder to always check with your doctor before you go wild swimming. Oh, Ta da! Can't Yay. wait. This has your name written all over it, Judy. No, I have to say, Rowena, when you told me that there was a Victorian plunge pool here, <laughs> I immediately packed this a swim cap and a swimming costume. But I'm quite jealous of your swimming costume. You look glamorous, it's oh. fashionable. What is that? It's a Victorian bathing outfit of course an antique one I've got especially for our wedding night in fact the very last time I wore this I went for a plunge in the pool and this is the next time after that I'm so cute. <laughs> that is so this is your first time doing a plunge in a while well, right? I'm not so bad about cold water because I'm rather thin like you yeah. but you're much braver than I am you're a wild swimmer so it's basically spring fed so it's, it's literally yeah. like the coldest water so I think it might be even more freezing than Mapperton we'll have to see I what know. you think the Victorian pool is a short walk away on the estate. But we think it's built by Lord Liverpool, part of the kind of pleasure garden thing that he, he absolutely loved Pitchford and made it all singing, all dancing. Right. And, and his he... daughter was the one who's friends with Queen Victoria, so maybe they went for a dip, you never know. Oh my goodness. I bet they probably did. She didn't write about that in her diaries, no, she... but I like to speculate. <laughs> <laughs> I'll speculate with you. Yes, I agree. I think this is literally the first time I've been in since my wedding night. Yes! <laughs> Good, I'm glad um, I could somewhat inspire you. Georgiana to... and everyone, they go in loads. <laughs> but... And so here we are. I can't wait to show you. It's literally the most perfect. Oh. Put that oval pool. It's, we've got the plug <gasps> and Pitchford. This is the perfect plunge pool. It's perfect. Oh my goodness. So the only question is, Julie, would you like to go on the right hand side or the left hand side? Mm. I think. Well, okay, so I'll go down that step. We can kind of go down together. Remember, it's just a sensation. Just, just a, a sensation. sensation. It's just, just a sensation. sensation. It's just a sensation. That's what I say to myself over and over again. That's As we go answer. down, we're just set sensation and breathing. It's just a sensation <laughs> and we're breathing. It's just... I'm going to get a yoga lesson on the way past me, though. <laughs> exactly. I'm we're... learning a lot here. Just a sensation. Just a sensation. Just a sensation. Just a sensation. Free. Oh. Wonderful. Boiling. It's boiling hard. Oh, it's boiling. Oh, it's boiling. 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 It's we I'm did it! Yay! <laughs> we did have an audience behind, um, which is great. But do you see how, it's can you start to feel how the, se the, the sensation the sensation starts to come in? And then it's like amazing. And it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. So I think we've done it. Is everybody happy? Yeah. Yay! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> So excited to show you the attic, Julie. Oh my goodness. You know, this is what I love about these historic houses. There's always attics and secret places. What do you guys think of this attic for hiding? Or is it too scary? Too scary. Too scary. <laughs> too, too scary. <laughs> this is incredible. Let me ask first and foremost, when you came back in 2016 and you came up to that attic was this at least okay as in more than okay I mean just so good to see it like this because my parents spent 10 years doing the roof in the 80s so the one fantastic like I mean my parents legacy was the house would have fallen down in 25 years if it wasn't for the roof so to be able to come in here is very reassuring and the 
green oak that was here originally and it's just the guts of the house, isn't right. it? Right. And as you can see from here, the other thing that reassured me was the bats are still here. And that's a, we had a, a plague of bats in the 80s, so it's nice to see the bats are still the, around. The bats were, were still around. I mean, absolutely stunning just to see this, that these have really survived for, gosh, Almost 400 yeah. years. Yeah, yeah. Let's look it, how brilliantly they, these they've are survived. Brilliant, but it's it's vast up here. I mean, to think that the servants used to live up here. I mean, there are taper marks. So that's why this was yeah, built the, for the servants yes, to live up here. And they hung their curtains on these pot. No. So I, that, when I see that, I kind of can picture an actual person, yes. you know, Downton Abbey style, up here. Absolutely. It's literally like Alice in Wonderland Julie, up this, here. <laughs> this is this is the clock tower that's so kind of prominent. <gasps> you know, when, when you're on the when you're on the south lawn and you're looking up yes. to the house, and <laughs> Edward's just testing it. So this obviously used to used to work. There's a mechanism which was just here. It's being restored at the moment, and then there are these huge kind of weights down there and a pulley system. And the date of, can we find a date? I've already spotted it. <laughs> what was it? Well, 17... because it's 1776. Yeah, it's cool, isn't so, it? So, but is that an American connection? I don't know, I don't know. But because it's, that's I when know. we've really, yeah. you know, we declared yeah. our freedom. Yeah, no, I know. 1776. I know, it's incredible. We've got to do some research yeah, on no, this. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. So anyway, look, it's, it's been there. And we, we look, it's, it's another job for us to, to get this kind of restored, yep. get the mechanism working, get the kind of pulleys working and get this, you know, chiming out on the hour or every, every half hour. And before we make our way downstairs, Rowena shows me a rare structural treasure of Pitchford's medieval past. So this is the thing, so in the 80s, they're doing the roof and I, there's huge excitement. They basically suddenly discover, if you possibly could shine a light, yep. you will see a medieval crown post. So it proves that whole thing there at the back, the, the bendy bit. So that's where the Pitchford family, <gasps> so this house is built on top of the Pitchford family house, which I love. My goodness, so they Isn't discovered so cool? this when they were yeah, redoing so we the roof. we didn't even know it was here. We knew, we obviously had... Yeah, I can see that. We, we were very sure that it was likely, but no one had proof. And then this and is so your proof right it's here. It's basically here. Look, it's called a crown post roof. And very little crown post roofs survive because they're so incredibly old from the medieval times. But this is a little piece of history to prove the point. Absolutely. I mean, w w wonderful. I mean, it's, it's just, I mean, you'll have more and more treasures. I mean, don't you find that with these historic houses? I mean, I know you yeah. grew up here, but oh, no, you're we're back still discovering you're still, you still discover yeah. over and over again. You still discover. We're learning all the time. Yeah. One of the first restoration projects the family took on when they moved back to Pitchford in 2016 was the summer house. No small task as it had completely disappeared under a web of ivy and moss. Well, I can see here that you've repaired this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you can also see all the woodwork. <laughs> well, the woodwork. Uh, I wasn't through. gonna say anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, so there's a bit more to do. But. but this is one of the big restoration projects that you have completed. And what is this called again, remind me. So it is, I, I call it the Pitcher of Summer House. Right. And it is, it's Edwardian. I, I think it's Edwardian. Yes. It's probably, we, we've got, we, we appear in Country Life in 1901 and 1917. Between 1901 and 17, it appears, the Summer House. I and, see. and all these kind of uh, red sandstone retaining kind of walls. Right. Uh, so quite a lot of work was done in, in the kind of early Edwardian yes. uh, ages. And, and this is, in my view, an Edwardian Summer House. So it's a huge transformation. And one of the first jobs we did was actually get up on the roof. I remember with my, my father, who's 80, 85 now, and we were just cutting back the ivy kind of on, on the roof to try and get things back so at least we could see yeah, what we well. had to restore. <laughs> uh, and the, 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 the roofer has done a brilliant job. Um, these are called Harnage Stone Slates. They're quarried about three miles away. Okay. Um, they're, you know, they've got loads of fossils in them. They're absolutely stunning. That should give it 30, 40, 50 years of, you know, life. Hopefully. Exactly. 
and an enjoyment yeah, exactly. for others. Exactly. I mean, it's, it is beautiful, but I know that this is not the only renovation that's been completed. Yeah, it's quite a big right. one coming up. That's right. Celebration. There, there, there is a there is a big one coming up, <laughs> and it, it was it was inspired by someone who actually lives in a, a historic house about 10, 15 miles away from Pitchford, called Acton Rand Hall, and he came. He knew Pitchford very well uh, when Rowan's parents. Own the, own the house and he came to us about a year and a half ago and said you need to restore the library you know that's your number one priority and you know we <laughs> we've done it and he came up with a design based on a, a, Hampton, a garden in Hampton Court a Tudor garden right uh, in Hampton Court and it, it's well you know you'll see it you'll see it soon um, it, it's quite wacky it's quite wacky <laughs> oh my goodness Okay, I have lots of questions. Yeah, no, no, um, I, yeah, it's quite out there. It's quite over the top. I think um, it's absolutely brilliant. So when you got Pitchford back, what was in this library? So this, this, was, this was very derelict. Um, it was one of the worst, it's one of the worst rooms in the, in, in the house, actually. Right. So that, oh, that was it. Oh my goodness, uh, no. Yeah. Yeah. If everything was gone, and this is what it looked like in uh, 1992, you know, when when yeah. Rowan's parents left no. it. So you know, it was a nice country house library, Absolutely. and all the books were sold at the Christie's auction. Um, of and then bizarrely, in in the space between 1992 and 2016, all these book um, cases were stripped out, oh. and we don't really know why. And, right. and that's why we ended up with, you know, a room that was, in a sense, a blank canvas and allowed us to, you know, create this neo-Tudor Gothic um, library. A lot of people have said to us, if you have got a blank canvas, do stamp your own mark on it. Don't, you don't have to inherit kind of everything from, yes. from other people's tastes, you know, Georgians, Victorians, Elizabethans, et cetera, et cetera. So we did feel we could maybe strike out yeah. in a slightly different direction. And we felt that you know this, this was a beautiful library, yes. but we didn't we didn't need to we didn't really need to go back to that. But it was inspired by this man, you know, uh, Hugh Kennedy, who who you know lives relatively nearby, and he said this is this is where I think you should go. Yes. And these are fantastic. Yeah, I mean it's, those oh. those appeared about two three weeks ago, uh, and we had fun hanging them. Lovely. Up. I mean they're heavy. Lovely, yeah, but here, seriously right heavy. here, and I do see on each of the uh, uh, bookcases you've got different sort of coat of arms. Uh, so it starts with the Pitchford family in, in uh, the kind of Crusader uh, night, uh, and then it goes along to the Otley family, the Coates family, the Jenkinson family, the Grant family, Rowena's family, the Colthurst family, my family. Right. Uh, and we've even got uh, the Curator Princess. Um, Do you? Marked, uh, marked, marked there. Oh my uh, so we, we felt, you know, she was part of that line from yes. what, 1280. Um, so we wanted to, you know, incorporate and everyone's incorporate uh, coats of arms. Every library needs good heraldry, yeah, so exactly. this is outstanding. <laughs> it's, it's, it's fantastic. So we're having, there's a, obviously a celebration yeah, tonight. Yeah, it's yeah. sort of the commemoration or the yeah, cutting of it, the ribbon. It, it, it's to thank you know, it's to thank the volunteers essentially who, well, and, and the donors. So, you know, a lot of people who've donated money towards getting the library to this to this mm. state, and a lot of people have donated their time in terms of painting. Yes. So through the winter, you know, those, those kind of long winter nights, there are about 20, 30 people in Shropshire just kind of painting away. Incredible. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's so kind of them. So yeah. th this is a so kind of thank you guys. Uh, for being so incredibly supportive of, you know, the yes. Bishford restoration. Yes. Now, time to join Rowena and the family for some more fun on the water. Here we are. Yay! Yay! <laughs> so... You're in for a treat, Julie. I'm really excited because I don't know anything about... Do you call it coracling? Coracling. You said it literally Cor perfectly. What is a coracle? And tell me about how this was a part of your growing up. Oh, no, absolutely delighted to. So a coracle, as you can see, is an absolutely fabulous, very simple fishing boot. So the essence was this is an iron bridge coracle. So iron bridge obviously being in Shropshire close by. So the, it was quite expensive to go across the actual iron bridge. So instead, they would um, have a cheap and cheerful way of 
fishing and getting across the river. How easy or hard is it to fall in? If you get it right and do the perfect figure of eight, which will be very, very simple to teach you, not a problem at all, not even a ripple. But if you <laughs> get a bit overexcited and things, then they can tip over very easily, which is really great fun. So I used to have a great time tipping all my friends into the right, right. lake in my childhood. <laughs> but I promise I won't do that to you. Okay. So you know that I showed you the pitch well? Yes. And the natural pitch was seeping up. So of course, look, these are tar bottomed <gasps> boats. They are literally, so they come, that's how you waterproof them. So every year we used to, you know, the spring would come out, this amazing weather, yes. exactly this time of year, and we'd retile <gasps> the things all ready so that they're waterproof, because obviously they start leaking off. Using your own, using pitch. Our own pitch. So basically Getting we've got in. you, a, absolutely got you a life jacket. I'm sure you're a brilliant swimmer, Julie. So is, do, do I, am I rowing? So it's really a figure of eight, um, and it's very, very simple. I just have this feeling I'm going to fall in. I can, I just... You know, when you kind of go into things like this with no experience and you get this gut feeling that you're going to fall in, I think that's what's going to you're happen. Not, you're not going to fall in. <laughs> okay, are you, are you really holding on to this? Okay, so I'm facing out. Okay, here, oh yeah. Thanks, James. Okay. You see, okay. then you sit right in okay. the middle, perfect balance. Oh do you feel happy? Yeah, I feel happy. Okay, now, so do, are you balanced? I'm right by the... Are you balanced? <laughs> I'm by land, I'm balanced, yeah. Okay. And it's very gently, just don't do any sudden movements. You'll be fine, a little bit of a figure of eight. Yeah, yeah, just feel oh! oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Okay. Oh! They're much more stable than you think. It's really... I'm trying to do what Georgiana was doing. Oh my goodness, this figure of eight. <laughs> what? You're so, doing brilliantly, Judy, that's perfect. Is, this, is it? So I'm watching Georgiana. Edward, how am I doing? On a scale of one to ten. Three. Three. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Maybe you get it. Okay, okay, let's show. Let's have a little. You're doing brilliantly. <laughs> Going in circles here. I mean, I mean, I got out here. So, so at least I didn't stay there. Going in the circle. I'd say I found this incredibly restorative. It's, it's wonderfully soothing. I loved it. I would do this every day for my mental health. Every day. I loved it. I thought it was just brilliant. Well but now it's just getting off. Yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> Here we go. Thank goodness for James. All right, so okay. you tell me when I'm good. I, I, would, I would jump quickly. Okay, great. Oh, gosh. Yes. Yay. Bye. Oh, Bye. I loved it. So I really impressed. loved that. I have to say, I'm happy I had my life jacket on, though, because Georgiana and Serena were telling me about the size of the fish <laughs> in, in there. So I was happy I, I had this on. That, that was brilliant. That was so brilliant. What better way to end my current visit to Pitchford Hall than to join the party celebrating the restoration of the library. Just walking in here, you can't help but smile because really this is Rowena and James's mark on things. They walked into this room in 2016 and it was wet and damp and empty and a clean slate and they thought rather than putting it back to what people expect us to do and what it used to be, let's create something that people will talk about. And that's what you want. When people come into these historic houses, you want people to leave talking about something. And I'm definitely, um, I, I definitely will be talking about this, and I bet you will as well. This extraordinary library that has been commissioned. And for me, the pieces that stand out are the chandeliers. I love the chandeliers because I love the contrast of this sort of very dark red and gold yellow with the blue and the yellow as well. And it's really rather wonderful. We ra raise a toast to Hugh Kennedy and the King Henry Library. <laughs> and everyone who helped, thank you so, so much. <laughs> What an amazing time I've had visiting Pitchford Hall. 
you can really sense the life and vitality returning to this historic home.